So today what I'd like to talk about are some germline variants in the basic scission repair pathway and their relationship to cancer risk. Um, right, this one, okay. So if you have any questions, go ahead and interrupt me. Um, so what, one of the hypotheses of, of uh, how cells acquire a cancer phenotype is the mutator phenotype. And the mutator phenotype um, uh, results from um, deregulation of each of these pathways, DNA repair, DNA synthesis fidelity. Um, thank you. <laughs> that might be better. Good. Cell cycle checkpoints, apoptosis. And when all of these pathways are deregulated, acquisition of a mutator phenotype can occur, uh, and that can actually lead to a malignant phenotype. And that's sort of the hypothesis that we operate under. under. And um, I would say that evidence from the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, is pretty strong that uh, a lot of uh, tumors actually have a, a mutator phenotype. So I'd like to briefly go through the basic scission repair pathway. What's important to know about this pathway is that it repairs small base damage, and this occurs about at greater than 20,000 times per cell per day. So this is a really very uh, well-used pathway, and it's probably uh, the, the most uh, used repair pathway in the cells because there are 20,000 lesions per cell per day. So it can be initiated through a monofunctional glycosylase, which just removes the base damage, leaving an abasic site, <clears throat> or by a bifunctional DNA glycosylase, which does both. But what's important to know is that downstream of this, you can either have a long patch repair or a short patch repair, and that fill-in of the gap is done by a polymerase that we've worked on for years called DNA polymerase beta, followed by ligation. And this occurs at least 20,000 times per cell per day. So this is a major DNA repair pathway. Now, <clears throat> what I'd like to tell you about is some of the work that our lab has completed. And first I'd like to tell you that uh, the literature suggests that Paul beta variants are observed in approximately 30 percent of human tumors. I can tell you that work done in my lab by Kate Donegan and Grace Sun suggests that this is really the case in colorectal cancer, and we're preparing that for submission. And we've shown that the tumor-associated variants have functional phenotypes that lead to aberrant DNA repair, genomic instability, and cellular transformation. So the idea is that these base excision repair variants in tumors might be driving a more malignant phenotype or might be an initiating event. We just don't know at this point. And what, we've what we uh, think is happening based on the phenotypes of these variants is first you can have, in DNA polymerase beta, you can have a mutator variant, so when it fills in this gap after base removal, a mutation occurs. If that occurs in a key growth control gene, and you can imagine these are, these can be oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes, but also all kinds of other things like microRNAs, for example, uh, cellular transformation can result. You can have a low Paul beta activity variant, low polymerase, which actually uh, leads to uh, slow gap filling or no gap filling, resulting in chromosomal aberrations, genomic instability, and cell transformation. And <clears throat> a variant that has low DRP lyase activity, so this can no longer be ligated, leaving uh, this open to, again, DNA breaks and genomic instability and the creation of chromosomal aberrations. Uh, we, so we haven't seen them in normal tissue. We, there are germline variants, right. but we haven't seen these variants in normal tissue. In our study, and we've done microdissected normal tissue outside the margin, which is weird, <laughs> but it's interesting. <laughs> Today what I'd like to talk to you about <clears throat> is a DNA glycosylase variant that is a germline variant. So I just gave you the summary on the tumor-associated variants, and today I'd like to talk about the germline variants. And, and there's a bifunctional DNA glycosylase, and this is the, the enzyme that initiates repair, so it finds the damage and it takes it out. And the bifunctional glycosylase takes the damage out and nicks the backbone. The NTH1 glycosylase is the one I'm talking about today, and it removes a variety of lesions. We'll focus a little bit on uh, uh, the, the uh, 5-hydroxy-6-hydrouracil lesion a little bit today, but it removes a bunch of oxidized bases. And it's present in the germline in about 4.5 percent of the population studied in the Environmental Genome Project. 
there are mistakes in the Environmental Genome Project, and the population isn't exactly as diverse as we'd like it to be. So that's why I'm, I'm telling you this. We've shown that it's an inactive DNA glycosylase. So the first evidence for this is it turns out that a lot of these human enzymes can actually substitute for, this, for the uh, homolog in E. coli. And so in E. coli, if you remove these two base excision repair genes, the, the cells have a mutator phenotype, and we're looking at uh, mutations to rifamycin here. So they have a mutator phenotype. And if you put in the wild type E. coli gene, it knocks down that mutation frequency. Now, if we actually uh, take this and just put a vector in, we see that the mutation frequency is high. If we complement this with the wild type human glycosylase gene, it brings it down. So there's full complementation, similar to the E. coli gene itself. But here's this variant that's present in the germline of individuals, 4.5 percent of the population, and it doesn't bring down this mutator phenotype or this high mutation frequency. What's even more interesting is that <clears throat> If we purify the enzyme and uh, look to see if we can actually get it to remove these lesions, these dihydroxyuracil lesions, or have lyase activity, here's the substrate, here's the product. You can see for uh, the variant, we're not getting product. This is actually a dead enzyme. It's a very dead enzyme. And it's present in a heterozygous state in 4.5 percent of the population. So the next question we asked was, does this inactive DNA glycosylase lead to cellular transformation? And so I need to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in the lab for a while. Uh, we use a vector provided to us by Dan DeMeo, and this is an inducible vector, and so we can put the wild type or the variant cDNA, and we infect uh, immortalized uh, mouse cells, they're epithelial cells, but they're not transformed. And what we try and do is, is, is pick out clones that express the variant to equal levels as the endogenous uh, protein is expressed. So we've got the mouse endogenous and the human protein, and we isolate stable clones and we can passage them. And in the presence of TAT, the expression is off, and in the absence, the expression is on, and we look at focus formation. This isn't, uh, this isn't uh, fluorescence. This is actually cells growing on top of each other, really old-fashioned stuff, very straightforward, and this is how we do it. And so we have our clone, and we keep that intact, and we do this for several clones, and then we can induce expression by removing the threat, uh, the TET from the medium, and we passage the cells, and we keep passaging them, and about every four passages, we set aside cells to look at cellular transformation, and after about 20 days or so, we stain them with crystal violet, and we count the foci. And this is how the foci look. So this is just an example. This is non-induced. This is induced. This is obviously a variant that transforms cells. You can see here that these are foci, and these are cells that grow on top of one another. They don't form a nice monolayer, but they grow on top of each other. And that's what we count. So this is wild-type human NTH1, and we did this assay. This is actually five different clones, but I wanted to show you. I know you're not supposed to ever make graphs like this, but what I wanted to show you was that it doesn't form foci. And I think you believe me, whether we induce it or don't induce it, we never see, at least up to passage 8, that these cells, that wild-type expression in these mouse cells induces focus formation. But we do for the variant. This variant that's a germline variant, there are three clones. Non-induced is the dashed line, and induced is this uh, <coughs> straight line. And you can see for three different clones, we see that if we express them, in the mouse cells, we get focus formation. And I, this is absolutely remarkable to me. So how do we think this is working? So the DNA is damaged, and this glycosylase probably doesn't remove much damage. And now we've got damage in the DNA. Now that could be moved by, removed by a redundant pathway, or it could be uh, uh, replicated by a lesion polymerase called a translesion polymerase which would likely, when it uh, synthesizes across this lesion, uh, put in a mutation, as what happens in E. coli. And this, this, there are a number of polymerases in the cell that can do this, called translesion DNA polymerases. And so what we think is happening is that the cells are accumulating mutations caused by translesion synthesis. These mutations can occur in a number of different genes that would lead to cellular transformation especially when one passages cells and is selecting for fast-growing cells 
in an assay like focus formation. Now we have a little bit more work to do obviously on this. We have to see if we have to test this hypothesis and see if these cells have mutations uh, and, and a high mutation frequency and we're doing that now. And uh, we also have to confirm this by using some other assay and what we're doing now is using an invasion assay and so far the results of the invasion assay look really uh, intriguing. So this is remarkable to us. Now what I'd like to talk about is, is work from a graduate student in my lab, Jenny, and what she uh, wanted to work on were, was a germline uh, variant of DNA polymerase beta, and this happens to be uh, the, the polymerase, again, I'll remind you during base excision repair that fills in this gap. So this is a, a drawing that she made of DNA polymerase beta, and she started out, there were uh, four different variants, uh, but the two variants that, that, sh that she actually started to work on was uh, R137Q, which is in the thumb. This polymerase has, has uh, a palm, which is the active site, and fingers, which actually uh, bind the DNTP, and a thumb, which binds the DNA in an 8KD domain, which has DRP lyase activity. Um, but the variant I'm going to talk about today is P242R, and that's located in this loop. This loop is actually really important for activity, and uh, especially the base of the loop. And so she was very interested in, in, in this variant. It turns out that carriers have decreased lung cancer survival, carriers of this variant. That's all that's known about it. And so Jenny decided to genotype 11 SNPs um, in collaboration with the Kid Lab. Uh, these are SNPs that came out of the Environmental Genome Project. And what she actually found was that four of, two of the SNPs that came out of the Environmental Genome Project were really not SNPs at all, or they were present at such low frequency that we couldn't detect them in Ken's population. But she genotyped about 2,500 individuals from a number of worldwide populations. And Paul beta variants are really rare, and I'll show you that the P242R variant is incredibly rare. It's present in about 3% of the population, and these people are mostly Eastern Europeans. So again, it's a really, really rare variant. Now, Jenny went on to look at the biochemistry, and the ancestral is actually here the wild type. And this is a typical uh, uh, biochemical assay that we do in our lab just to measure rate. So this is the wild type, and this is the variant. And you can see the variants, you know, half as, half as uh, fast as the wild type. So it's not incredibly, incredibly slow. The other polymerase variants we've worked with from tumors are nearly dead. This one actually has some activity. She went on to show, this is a binding curve where we're looking at enzyme concentration versus enzyme fraction bound. This is a gel shift assay, essentially, that they have about equal binding affinities for DNA. So this is a slow variant that can bind to DNA. So there's a possibility it could act as a dominant negative, and it could get to the gap before wild type and fill in that gap really slowly. So again, what she wanted to know is because it's a slow polymerase, might it have some effect on a cellular phenotype? And so the first thing she did was really to ask, does a slow polymerase lead to cellular transformation? And the answer is yes. And this was very exciting to us. So here she's looked at two clones. And so the dashed black line and the solid black line are one clone. And this is non-induced and this is induced. Now, this might not look like the other slide, but you have to see that this axis is a little different. So she's seeing about 800 foci here when she looks at focus formation. And this is about a little less than 200 foci, so dash is uninduced and the solid line is induced. And so she does see focus formation in two separate clones of this germline variant. And she went on to look at anchorage independent growth in, in two different clones, again, non-induced and induced. And what she sees is a statistically significant difference between these, and the, this clone actually does uh, grow in soft auger. So it doesn't do cellular transformation. This is pretty much what growth in soft auger looks like. And so how might this work? This is a, a, a now a base excision repair scheme that was just stolen from Friedberg's book. And um, so again, the base is damaged, glycosylase removes the base, AP endonuclease incises the backbone, and the Paul beta DRP lyase gets rid of this uh, DRP group and fills in the gap. 
So here we have a gap. So we know, by the way, that the P242, our germline variants, DRP lyase activity is just fine. So it has to have something with gap filling, and the hypothesis is that gaps remain unfilled or partially filled. Replication comes along, and when that replication comes along, a double-strand break is created. Once we have a double-strand break, <clears throat> this can lead to aberrant end joining and chromosomal aberrations especially if, they're, if the cell is overwhelmed with breaks. There won't be enough for the BRCA and a, a machinery to process, probably leading to a degradation that's uh, catalyzed by the MRE11 uh, complex. So if there's a lot of degradation, or even a little bit, this will stay open, and there can be aberrant end joining and chromosomal aberrations. So the first thing Jenny asked was, are there chromosomal aberrations? And here's how she did it. She just made metaphase cells, metaphase spreads from cells expressing the wild type or the variant. And these are mouse embryo fibroblasts. So she just expressed this for a few passages in the cells. And then she looked for really nice pictures and well-spread metaphases, and she looked for fusions, breaks, and fragments. And she actually, um, this is sort of a typical slide uh, where she sees, uh, here's a fusion, for example. And what she's done is quantified them here. So the ancestral, again, is the wild type. And the uh, germline variant um, here is the, is the dark uh, box, the dark column. And you can see here that the variant really does induce more fusions to occur in the cells, and also more acentric chromosomes. And she sees a lot more fragments resulting from breaks. And so she does see chromosomal aberrations induced by expression of this variant for only a few passages in mouse embryo fibroblasts that are otherwise wild type. She's gone ahead and used uh, a telomere probe to look at the fusions to see if they're telomeric fusions. And indeed, they are telomeric fusions, which is very interesting. Um, the hypothesis here being that these fusions um, are created, as are the acentrics through the breakage fusion bridge cycle originally described by McClintock. But we don't know that yet. We have work to do on that. So then the next question she wanted to ask is, is this occurring through a double-strand break? And so she looked at uh, gamma H2AX staining because gamma H2AX is a, is a marker for double-strand break formation. And she wanted to treat these cells with uh, methylmethane sulfonate, um, which actually induces base excision repair because she wanted to induce more breaks so that she could um, see this, see the breaks uh, within her lifetime and graduate from graduate school with a thesis of PhD. And I think that was wise. So what she did was she seeded the cells at low density, treated with MMS for a short period of time. This is an alkylating agent. And then probed for uh, gamma H2AX, and she looked on the confocal at the cells. And she measured the intensity of gamma H2AX staining. And this is her graph. So what she's shown here is pretty interesting. So this is the time after treatment, from uh, after MMS treatment. And again, this uh, light, this sort of simple color box is the ancestral, and the dark red box is the variant. So we're looking here at time and versus intensity using the ImageJ program. And so for no MMS, the cells, you know, they have the same number of double-strand breaks. So it's a good thing she decided to use MMS or else she would have never seen anything. And then after no time, after treatment of MMS, she sees more breaks, which is MMS does induce breaks. 30 minutes, more breaks. But now look what starts to happen. After an hour, uh, things start to come down. These are probably breaks do, induced by MMS itself, not through base excision repair. And then after uh, about uh, uh, two hours, you see that the variant continues to accumulate breaks or doesn't repair breaks. It's probably a process where it's, it's it, it going in both directions. In other words, it's accumulating and not repairing. And you can see the same thing occurs after four hours, whereas the wild type breaks go down to background. So there is a problem, likely, with break repair in these cells, leading to the chromosomal aberrations that I told you about. So how does this work? This is what we think that we have uh, an abasic site after removal of the damage and very slow gap filling. And this leads to replication fork collapse and S-phase dependent, likely, double-strand break formation. 
And we have to look at this now uh, using fax analysis and synchronizing the cells and everything. Um, what usually happens is that BRCA2 stabilizes the fork, and if there's, there are a lot of breaks, we'll have a lot of forks that are collapsed, uh, probably overwhelming uh, the system. And this could, uh, these, this high level of double strand break formations um, is likely to lead to chromosomal aberrations in the cell and cellular transformation. We all know that cancer cells have a lot of genomic instability. <clears throat> okay, so what I told you about today were the germline DNA repair variants that induce cellular transformation and they're likely associated with cancer risk. Now, this is really important because just for basic scission repair alone, there are over 100 germline SNPs in encoding parts of genes that have been documented. There are many, many more non-coding DNA, and they, of course, can be important in gene regulation. And we're trying to study as many of these germline SNPs as possible. So what we think is that these SNPs could be associated with cancer risk and what I didn't talk about today, because I didn't think I'd have time, were therapeutic responses. So what we do know in, with some of these SNPs is that they have uh, different responses to DNA damaging agents, like temozolomide, ionizing radiation, and alkylating agents. And they could also contribute to other diseases. And I, I put that in there because it looks like uh, that DNA repair SNPs uh, probably also contribute to autoimmunity. So our future directions. Our lab has uh, made what I'll call as a DNA repair uh, sequencing chip. It's actually not a chip. It's the Agilent-based system. And we've successfully been able to capture all the DNA repair genes uh, in, from, a DNA, from DNA samples and sequence them using the Illumina uh, uh, platform. And uh, <clears throat> so now we're moving on to look at all the DNA repair variants in tumors and in the germline of people. And we have a couple of very interesting cohorts of people that we're looking at at this point. Um, we're generating mouse models. Uh, we have one mouse model right now of a, a Paul Beta repair variant, and it's a very interesting model in that it, it looks like um, it actually has autoimmune disease, and if you'd like to talk with me about that, I'd be glad to. And we're also uh, doing mechanistic studies on, on the glycosylates variant and the Paul Beta variant to really understand how they transform cells. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the people who did the work. Uh, uh, Jenny did all of the work that I talked about with the P242R Paul Beta variant. Um, Heather is at the University of Vermont. She did the work uh, associated with the human NTH1 variant. And um, <clears throat> A lot of members of the Sweezy Lab and Susan Wallace's lab at the University of Vermont have contributed to this. And these are our collaborators, and the work is funded by the NCI, the NIEHS, and the Cancer Center. And I'll take questions.